Hi my loves, welcome back. We're gonna do some vlogging today and tomorrow I think. I've just been listening to Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She's a scientist um, and writer obviously of Potawatomi Descent and she narrates the book actually, the audiobook. It's a non-fiction book about plant life basically. It's just such a beautiful book, a combination of her scientific botany knowledge, you know, a beautiful literary poetic style and memoir, sort of um, drawing on her life experiences to talk about plants and plant life and also obviously with a view to talking about Potawatomi, indigenous knowledge of plant life as well. Um, so it just combines so many different things, which is one of my favourite things in non-fiction books especially. I loved it in Underland. I think Robert McFarlane does a really good job in that book of doing, like, combining the science with the literary. And this book too is just wonderful. Um, and she reads it so beautifully and I think it really benefits from being read aloud actually. Particularly when she's um, speaking the Potawatomi language. Um, just so beautiful. You know, you really get a sense of her voice. So I'm sort of in a braiding sweet grass daze. I've just been listening to that while I get ready. But I have started like a film club, cinema club on the Patreon. Well, we have started it collectively really. And yeah, I've been talking about it for a few weeks and finally got it sort of up and running. So today I think I'm going to catch up with the films that we are watching. We're going to watch a film a week. Um, week one is uh, like a best films, like working through a best films of all time list. I just found one from Letterboxd, which I think the creator of the list combed through quite a lot of top films lists and put this one together. Um, so we're going to work our way through that one in week one of every month and week two of every month. We're going to work through the movie top 1000. So that's more like indie films. Um, in weeks three and four we're gonna have maybe a theme or two films that work nicely with one another or two films that are related to the book club book so it's a bit more flexible for weeks three and four and we're gonna vote on stuff for that as well so I am so excited about it and in general I'm just feeling really excited about the Patreon as I'm sure you've been able to tell how much it's helping me just consume more culture and art um, to be able to discuss it with like-minded people from around the world is just incredible and I'm loving it and I kind of want to expand on it some more but I'm loving this new cinema club that we're going to do together so yes I'm going to catch up with some films today because um, I'm not feeling I'm not feeling too great Inez was ill over the weekend so I'm kind of tired from that and then I think I might have a little bit of what she had. So I'm just feeling a bit like bleh today. So I think catching up with the films is gonna be a good thing. Um, and in order to do that, I'm very, very excited about this. Sky have sent me their new service, brand new service called Sky Stream. I think what I might do is go and get it set up. I've got the putt and a nice fancy new remote here, but I'm gonna go get it set up and then I will chat to you a little bit more about what it involves. But I think it's such a good move from Sky and I think it's gonna be so helpful to so many people. So let's go and set it up. So my loves, I'm sure you could see there that that was so easy and quick to set up. Um, you can see the little puck there. It's so nice and compact, which we love. Um, so I've managed to put some more books on my bookshelves, which I'm always happy about. Um, I just literally plugged in the power supply, plugged in the HDMI, and we were set up within minutes. So if it wasn't already obvious, this is a fully Wi-Fi based service. So there's no need for a dish, which is incredible. Luckily, I actually have an ethernet cable here so I could plug my ethernet cable straight into the puck as well. But you could just log into your Wi-Fi as normal as well. You don't need an ethernet cable. But I just can think of so many situations where it would have been helpful to have a fully Wi-Fi based Sky service, like in my uni flats, um, when, you know, getting a dish sorted was just not really an option. Or even at the farm in some of the barns, getting a dish on the roof would be unsightly and not really practical either. So I'm super excited about this service and I think it's gonna appeal to lots of you because 
I don't know about you, one of my favourite things about Sky at the minute that we've been really enjoying, and Skystream is no different, is that everything is in one place. I'm getting so overwhelmed with all the different streaming services, all the different services out there, and I also like having access to just standard terrestrial channels as well. You know, like a normal TV guide as well as all the streaming services. And with Sky, you can have all your apps, you can have your Disney Plus, your Netflix, your iPlayer, whatever it is, even your Peloton app if you want to do um, at-home workouts in front of your TV, you can. Um, you can have it all in one place plus all of the normal channels, which I just love. Um, and it makes everything so much, so much more convenient. I also like having like, <laughs> a physical remote um, with which to control the television rather than doing it all on my phone or this or that, whatever it is. I'm just, we've been loving that element of Sky recently. They offer next day delivery on this so you can be set up, you know, the following day watching TV. I'm obsessed with Succession at the moment. I'm like, when I'm on TikTok, I'm on Succession Talk. I'm just loving the final series so much so far. I'm gonna be so sad when it's over. It's one of the best shows probably ever to be on TV and I just think it's incredible and I highly recommend it if you guys haven't seen it. Um, I really really recommend watching it. The comedy and drama combination is just perfect, the writing is incredible, the acting is incredible. Um, I just love it so so much. So next day delivery is going to bring it quicker to you. But yes, luckily I have Sky Cinema so I have access to a Paramount Plus subscription through that which is also very exciting because it just means one less streaming service to subscribe to and my film for today is on Paramount Plus and that is The Godfather so obviously week one best films of all time The Godfather appears on basically every single list somehow I've managed to never watch it so I'm really looking forward to watching it today it's got a lot to live up to so yeah our week one list from the top Godfather obviously no surprises there so let me see if I can find it Stream The Godfather. Aha, that was extremely easy. So that is all ready to go. I think I'm gonna grab some lunch and then we're gonna start. We've got three hours. Do you know, I've actually read the book, which is just classic me. I've read The Godfather book. It was a long time ago, so I barely remember anything, um, but it's up here, look. <laughs> um, I found this book would you believe, in Cuba. Me and my friend had gone on this horrible boat ride in Venezuela. We were in Los Roques and we were going from like one of the main islands to like a small island and the weather was not good and we shouldn't have gone out and it got worse as the day went on and the boat was just slapping against the waves like really a lot and I have a fear of boats ever since <laughs> but it broke my Kindle so this was during my gap year and um, I had read on my Kindle throughout the entire like six months basically and yeah it broke my Kindle finally so I was reading on my phone for a bit I think I seem to remember and then when we went to Cuba there was this outdoor uh, market there were there were some books there and not a lot of English language books obviously but they did have The Godfather so that is the story of how I ended up reading The Godfather um, whilst we were in Cuba and I remember really enjoying it but yeah I remember very 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 little of the storyline so I'm excited to get into the film but yeah I definitely need some lunch first so let's go and find some food I've just run up the stairs <laughs> Got some pesto pasta. I think I might even close the blinds for a full cinema experience. So let's watch. I believe in America. America has made my fortune. Hi my loves, good morning and welcome back. Um, obviously the Godfather took up most of the rest of my afternoon and then I just felt terrible. <laughs> Whatever virus we've got, it's very unpleasant. So um, I'm feeling a bit better today though. Let me update you with my thoughts on the Godfather which I think are gonna be 
a little controversial and or catch me some heat, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, there was lots to appreciate about that film, I think. Um, mostly how innovative it was at the time, I think, and sort of how groundbreaking it was at the time. But to a contemporary, slightly pedestrian film watcher like myself, to watch it now, I didn't find it very enjoyable. So there were bits that I liked. I really liked the opening scene, like the wedding scene with, um, you know, the wedding going on outside and then the kind of quiet of um, Don Corleone's salon. Um, and I liked the scenes set in Sicily. I liked the scene where Vito is playing with his grandchild. Um, I love the baptism scene at the end, totally works, the kind of contrast going on there. So there were definitely bits of it which I enjoyed and appreciated more, but obviously it is super long. It definitely dragged for me. I don't really know exactly what I was expecting, but yeah, I mean, there were obviously the performances were incredible. The lighting was, I think, very revolutionary at the time. The use of sound is great. So like all of that kind of stuff. I love that opening shot, which is like really long and like zooms out slowly. It's all very, I feel like um, it's obviously been very influential and from a historical perspective, very interesting. Like I, just like with books, there's some things that I like to watch or read just to get an idea of where like a movement began or something's influence on popular culture. I mean, I've seen the whole thing. I've seen obviously so many parodies of The Godfather. The one that comes to my mind is from Eight Simple Rules. I don't know if anyone watched that show. I mean, yes, people definitely watched that show because it's popular at the time, um, where I can't even remember what they're called, but she was played by Kaylee Cuoco. Puts the like grapes in her mouth and, you know, receives visits from her siblings and requests from her siblings. Um, that's not gonna make any sense for anyone that hasn't watched that scene, but I've obviously seen it par parodied like a million times as well Which I think sometimes like takes away its power a little bit But it's also quite interesting to just see the original. So yeah, that's my final thoughts But to be honest this tracks for me because things like art books generally from the early 20th century through to the 70s I usually prefer less than 80s plus. I'm a staunchly contemporary girl and there are absolutely exceptions to that as I'm sure there are and will be in film. For example, I actually quite like Taxi Driver. I definitely would say I prefer Taxi Driver to The Godfather. I watched that a long time ago but I remember enjoying it. So there are exceptions obviously to the rule but it's just a taste thing for me. Um, it goes for music as well. I just prefer everything basically from the 80s on. And if you're like that and you sometimes feel bad about not liking older stuff, contemporary art is very good. There's nothing better about art just because it's old. So I just want to throw that out there because especially at uni I felt, um, at least in my undergrad, not so much my master's, because my master's was in contemporary literature, culture and theory, but um, there's this um, lionization of classics and older literature but contemporary literature is doing exciting very clever things too so never let anyone make you feel bad about liking things from the period of life that you are actually living in um, or you know that feel more relevant to you or make sense more to your brain because of course they do. Also, sometimes with books and film from that period, and again, this is a bit of this is a bit reductive and doesn't apply to everything. It applies to some sort of mainstream things, but it doesn't apply to everything, and it is reductive. But sometimes I feel like it's like man art made for men. Do you know what I mean? Like it just something about it doesn't really speak to me at a soul level, and that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of it that would also still be enjoyable to me even though it's like man art made for men, but I don't really know how to describe it, but it doesn't like speak to my worldview, you know? Sorry, I'm wearing like the loudest shirt today and I don't know whether the microphone's gonna make it worse or better. Like it's just the material of it just makes a lot of noise. Like I don't know about you guys, but I often find those films that are more highly ranked as like the best films of all time, I bet that men have decided those rankings. That's how I feel about um, a lot of the films you'll find on like top films of all time rankings. It's like 
they're missing something for me as a female viewer. Again, not 100%, there's a lot of masculine literature I love um, and same goes for films. It's not a 100% sort of thing for me, but certainly it feels that way, like it trends that way for me. Um, and so I'm like a little bit skeptical about immediately taking those ratings and rankings for face value as well. Um, you can't deny the kind of influence of a film like The Godfather. So, so I'm interested to continue working through our sort of week one um, list and see if I kind of feel that trend continues or if I find some exceptions to that rule or some exceptions to my kind of slight disconnect from things made from the 70s and before. Um, and whether I can sort of overcome that disconnect with some films. As I said, Taxi Driver is one of those for me. I, I definitely um, remember enjoying it. And finally, a problem I think with The Godfather that I have is that just not massively interested in those kind of mobster, gangster, mafia storylines in and of themselves. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, here's what's happening, retaliation after retaliation after retaliation. Like, it doesn't intrigue me just on a basic level. I need, like, more. And I suppose the transformation of Michael from, um, spoiler here, I mean, it's quite an old film, from, like, upstanding veteran to, you know, head of the family um, is the interest there. That's the kind of layer and, you know... Um, people talk about it being like an allegory for Amer American capitalism and that kind of thing, which I get, but I don't know. That transformation I think would be the crux of it for me, but compared to how you might see that transformation in film today or in literature today, it's quite like, it doesn't feel very three-dimensional. I don't know. I feel, <laughs> I feel like this is not going to be a popular opinion, um, but it's okay I think to appreciate something for the time it was made in and it not be like a personal favorite of yours you know what I mean so I can see why it's on all of these best movies of all time lists because it was so influential but as an experience for me I didn't really enjoy it that much so you can call me uncultured if you wish <laughs> and like I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't really know what I'm talking about but that was my feelings anyway yeah if you would like to join us on the patreon join in on book club and now cinema club please do it is a lot of fun i have to say like it enriches my life so much anyway my loves i think i would head over to the house today but we've got the plasterers in Woo! and they usually stop work at about lunchtime so they start really early and then they just work through till about lunchtime and i think i might go after they've gone because it's quite intense i think there's a lot of them and they're all in the hallway so um Yes, but I would like to go over to the house today, show you some bits. I've not seen it for a few weeks and there are some changes. I did pop um, one of them on my Instagram recently, but yeah, I'm excited to see this hallway plastered. I don't think it's going to be finished today. I think they've got a couple more days work in them, but I think it's really going to make the house feel like less of a building site. Um, and some of the other rooms are getting plastered as well, so we're really getting there. I think once things are plastered they tend to look like rooms again so that's exciting. So I'll take you around to the house. Little reading update. Should we do a reading update? So while I'm waiting to go around to the house I might read a little bit more of this. I'm hoping to finish this today actually because I've got lots of things on my April TBR that I really need to be getting to. Also I'm really enjoying this. I actually really want to know where it's going um, but I just haven't had. It's one of those books which you really need like quiet to enjoy and I haven't had a lot of quiet and it's not one of those I can sort of read while Inez is playing or doing something or in the room with me because it just you just can't really get distracted from it and it's hard to dip in and out of it um, but this is just gorgeous I love it um, it's about a re Reverend John Ames he's writing a letter to his son he's sort of nearing the end of his life and he knows that his son will grow up without him so he's writing this long letter about sort of about his life and advice and faith um, and all of this kind of stuff. I love it. I think there's so much going on here that you could analyse and sort of look at but it, in general it's quite a quiet meditative novel and I just think it's absolutely beautiful. And as a person that's not particularly interested in religious novels, um, this one is absolutely wonderful. I think Robinson does a great, great 
job of um, creating a character whose approach to faith is quite not universal because you don't have to be Christian really to appreciate it um, but which is quite inclusive I suppose so a lot of it speaks to my worldview even if it isn't necessarily even if it's not in exactly the same forms like he has a really um, beautiful appreciation for like the being of life and the physicality of life and the beauty of it and the beauty of small moments which is just obviously um, speaks to me and it's just the meditations on life and love are very beautiful at the same time there is a plot here which I think as I said it was would be really interesting to analyze um, I won't go into loads of detail but it's just very interesting but I will talk about it more in my wrap up um, because I'm very interested to see where it ends up actually and now I don't feel so stupid for buying all four of these books when I was in America last year um, because I definitely want to read the others and I want to know what the other characters are thinking because the other books are about other characters. So I'm reading that, obviously we talked to you about Braiding Sweetgrass yesterday and the combination of these two novels with actual springtime is not sorry not novels the Braiding Sweetgrass is obviously non-fiction but the combination of these two books with actual springtime something about it is just so lovely like it really it's really like giving me appreciation for life you know for new life um, and just both of them reading them both together they don't really they sort of complement each other in that um, Gilead is obviously coming from a sort of very traditional Western Christian point of view but it still has really beautiful ideas about how precious life is and then Braiding Sweetgrass has that from an indigenous perspective and scientific perspective more less about how precious people are though it obviously is about how precious people are as well but also about how precious kind of plants and the earth and animals are to our life so um, they complement one another quite well even though they're very very different as well so yes I love that um, I'm also on my Kindle reading um, All Your Children Scattered um, it's a new novel I've been reading it on there for a while actually it's by Beata Mubiei Mairesi I may be reading that completely wrong but she is a I think a Rwandan author or yeah so she is Rwandan but she moved to France and the novel I think was originally written in Fran French and has been translated um, and it was an arc I got through NetGalley a little while ago and I've actually been reading it in tiny bits and pieces for a little while um, but because I've been so kind of focused on my other books I haven't really had a lot of time for it um, and I've also been DNFing a lot of arcs so I was sort of reluctant to put it on my Storycraft or my Goodreads for a little while because I was like if I put it on there I'm going to end up just DNFing it and it's going to really annoy people because they're going to be like stop DNFing books but I think I'm going to stick with this one. It's quite short as well. Um, it's quite heavy, which is, is why it doesn't necessarily like pull me in for the kind of Kindle reading I do is generally like in bits and pieces, like it's when I don't have access to a book. So told in this kind of lyrical perspective from the point of view of, I don't know if it's going to be two women or the whole family. It's very beautifully written and translated. Um, so it's quite lyrical despite it's kind of very heavy topic. Um, but yes I haven't really been pulled to it because in those sort of itty bitty moments but I think I might make some time for it soon and just actually get through a nice big chunk of it so that's another thing that I'm reading but yeah and I'm still reading my poetry book I'm still reading my um, Daughters of Africa anthology as well which um, I'm loving that anthology I just love anthologies I just think I need to read more I'm loving it I think I've talked about that recently but anyway my loves I'm gonna see how the plasterers are getting on and we're gonna head over to the house soon and I need some food too, I'm hungry. shower tiles in place this is the loft bathroom so obviously this will continue out these tiles all the way onto the floor of the whole room 
But we just went with a nice kind of small checkerboard in here. And yeah, so that's our drain there. Um, that kind of, it will be level apparently. Yeah, but so another trim to go. The little gap will be where the water drains. Lovingly made by Pete. <laughs> Literally welded it together for us. Very elegant. Okay, I'm very zoomed in because it's obviously quite backlit, but this is in his windows in place and it looks quite vibrant in real life. So as I said, the plasters have been in the hallway. There's something very elegant about the shape of these Victorian staircases kind of like sweeps down. Obviously we've created this so this is all new but it looks very natural. Just love all the curves and it's looking lovely. You can kind of, if you really squint, kind of get a feel for how it will look standing here looking into that room with the pink walls and the dark floor. Just like very elegant vibes, isn't it? So it's just putting one of these, sort of resting it in the wall. Not that the camera's focusing. There we go. Looking nice. Oh yeah, very satisfying. This is basically the only ceiling we could save. <laughs> The smallest, smallest possible ceiling. Everything else has been redone. Just thought I'd very quickly show you my outfit. It's giving work wear, which is bad because I keep going to the house in like <laughs> work wear and I know I'm not working on the house personally. Um, but it looks like I'm taking myself very seriously. Dickie's trousers on, this form and thread kind of half button up shirt, and then my blundstone boots. But I might get more comfortable now I'm home again, to be honest. Hi, my love. So I just finished Gilead, um, and I thought I would talk to you about it. Um, I came home from the house. And it was good to see some bits, but of course, Zach sends me big cheers all the time. Um, the Tyler is supposed to be coming in soon in the not too distant future. So I'm really excited to start seeing some tiles go up on the bathroom walls because we're waiting for the tiles to go up before various other bits can be done in, in the bathrooms. So yes, things are moving along slowly but surely but anyway I just I came home and it was just the sun was shining through the window and I just had such a lovely time reading Gilead before I left the house and I thought you know what? I'm just gonna finish it it's not gonna take me too long so I finished it and I just loved it like I said I like it on a kind of literary level even though it seems sort of meandering and at times plotless I think it is really actually very carefully plotted, very carefully written um, with certain kind of themes and imagery in mind, sort of repeated, repeated images, repeated plot points, I suppose. I'm not really sure quite how to put it if you haven't actually read the book. Um, and I loved it, but be warned because we did do a buddy read for this one and of the comments that I have read of those of us who have started and, and or finished this one, um, it didn't really appeal. <laughs> it didn't really appeal to anyone else that we did, that I've done the buddy read with yet. But I do know a few other Gilead fans in the Discord, so it's one of those that's a bit of a hard sell. Um, and we'll talk about that more in my roundup because uh, I, you know, I like to try and find the right readers for the right books. But if you like this kind of book, you're going to love this one. It's a very good example of it, and I personally love this kind of book. And yeah, so I liked it on a literary level and I also kind of liked it on a spiritual level. I've been feeling kind of down at the moment. You know, I'm desperate to get in my house. I feel like I've outgrown this house and this space and I'm just 
ready to move um and just feeling a little bit of like pressure like inward pressure almost um and reading stuff like this just sort of releases that a little bit it just very beautifully written and talking about spirituality and it kind of speaks to me a lot of my tiktok algorithm <laughs> seems to be about this recently about how in the modern world we're kind of missing um an element of spirituality and like with braiding sweetgrass as well how much spirituality is sort of part of the human experience and it makes us feel it doesn't have to be anti-scientific it doesn't have to be this or that you know um and it often brings communities together um you know a kind of common spirituality can be a really fulfilling thing and, and you see that a little bit in this book and you see it in braiding sweetgrass as well and how we're really sort of missing that in the modern world and definitely missing a sense of community as well and like third spaces spaces that are neither work nor um home and also not commercial spaces so you know spaces where communities can be together for free um and do meaningful things together um and you know that's something i'm really i've really it's been germinating in my brain that i would really love to create a third space or at least something akin to a third space and really create more of a community in my local area you know doing the patreon has been a wonderful thing and i have just reveled in having this online community um to to talk to like-minded people with and i would love to recreate something like that in person as well like in my in my area and really connect with people like physically um because i think that's what we're gonna need moving forward in life so um yes it really spoke to me let me just see if i can find this poem my camera battery is gonna die because i did not realize that the charger was not plugged in it reminded me of this fiona farrell poem which i read the other day in this being alive I believe in the gin it's called credo i believe in the gingerbread man who wouldn't run given the circumstances but not the father not the son i believe in forgiveness but not in sin i believe in communion bread wine apples and us all happy at table but not in saints i believe in life you have to don't you being alive but not everlasting those immortelles petals fallen like yellow teeth in the tomb bearing the form of flowers but not the scent, not the breath. It gives a sense of spirituality um, without the kind of organised religion perspective, which I don't think this book doesn't do, um, even though it's from a Christian perspective. So very interesting. And I, I really loved it. It's gone on my favourite books, definitely going on my favourite books of the year. And I also want to read the other books, but they're technically not on my 2023 TBR. So we'll see how, how much longer I can put them off but I really, really enjoyed this one. Hi, my loves. Same place, just a few hours later. I was so hungry for my dinner. I did not stop to film it whatsoever. Zach made us a very delicious pea and wild garlic risotto, and it was incredible and so spring-like. Um, and then as I was putting the baby down to bed, I did something horrible to my back, which is taking some painkillers and I've stuck a hot water bottle down the back of my trousers um, in the hopes of helping somehow, but uh, I'm in some pain right now, but I started Paradise earlier and have been reading it a little bit in fits and starts since, and I'm really, really liking it. It's obviously extremely dark, as most Morrison is. Um, but I'm really enjoying it so far. Do you know, although they're completely different books, I actually think it's been quite helpful to read Gilead because it really slowed me down and made me pay a lot of attention to the language and the sentences and really, and really reflect on what I was reading. And with Morrison, you absolutely need that attention to detail. So I am very much appreciating this one, actually. It is a little... Um, dense I suppose but I'm not really finding it too dense compared to other Morrison that I've read but I don't know if that's again just me always maturing as a reader or as I say having this like um, kind of granular attention to the language and the sentences to work out what's going on because it's not always super obvious with Morrison you do have to kind of read into it a little bit just to figure out exactly what's happening but yeah it's super dark 
but I find myself desperate to get back to it. <laughs> um, but I thought I would quickly run you through my April TBR. Um, a few books left over from my March one, so Foster I never got round to by Claire Keegan, A Dangerous Business. I didn't, did I put this in my last TBR? I think I did. I didn't get round to um, by Jane Smiley. Uh, our book club pick is When We Were Orphans by Kazuo Ishiguro, which I talked about before. Anything else left over? I think I mentioned this one last time too, which is The Telling by Ursula Le Guin. So those ones are left over from my March TBR. Let me just have a quick look at my list. So for Buddy Reads on the Patreon, I am doing one for the first book in this fat volume. Um, is the Border Trilogy by Cormac McCarthy. Now sort of regretting having, whenever I buy an omnibus I always sort of regret it. Um, I wish I had these as separate books but anyway um, I'm going to read All the Pretty Horses this month. I don't plan to read the whole of this volume this month, um, just the first book and then I might return to the following books over the following months. Really excited to read more McCarthy because I loved the road, my reread of The Road last year but I am very wary because I feel like The Road is a bit of an outlier in his work just from what I know of his work. I haven't read any of his other books so I don't exactly know. I think stylistically they're similar but thematically maybe or you know The Road is um, kind of a dystopia apocalyptic novel and I don't think any of his other novels are. I think most of his other novels are westerns. I personally love a western though so I'm not totally alarmed by that um, but we'll see I particularly love the tenderness in the road even though it didn't feel like there was a lot of tenderness there I really sensed it in the relationship between the father and the boy and I'm a bit worried I'm not going to find that same tenderness in some of his other books but we shall see what else have I got on here so other buddy reads so paradise we're doing a buddy read for and I cannot wait to hear others thoughts on it um, Augustus by John Williams so so many of us loved Stoner by John Williams in book, which we did for book club last year. So I'm really looking forward to Augustus. Again, of what I've, from what I've read of um, Williams's books, each one is pretty different. So I'm not really expecting something similar to Stoner necessarily. And this one is about, oh, I haven't even been reading blurbs, but let me go into this one. After the brutal murder of his great uncle Julius Caesar, Octavian, a shy and scholarly youth of 19, suddenly finds himself heir to the vast power of Rome. He is destined, despite vicious power struggles, bloody wars and family strife, to transform his realm and become the greatest ruler the Western world has ever seen, Augustus Caesar, the first Roman emperor. <laughs> Pretty different from Stoner, which is about, you know, a teacher, you know, an English teacher living in Missouri in the mid 20th century. I mean, couldn't get much different. So I'm very intrigued to see how Williams handles such a different topic. Um, and yeah, we're doing a buddy read for that one. I know that Arne is on that buddy read and she has been reading through all of Williams's work. So I think she's read his other two novels as well as Stoner. So I'm looking forward to her telling me which is her favorite Williams, but I do plan to read the other two as well. Also on my buddy read list, though I don't have a copy because I'm going to pick it up from the library tomorrow, is Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. Um, it's been talked about a lot, so I'm sure many of you who are kind of familiar with the bookish world have already heard of that one. Um, it the, the kind of the blurb gives me Je Jeff Vandermeer Annihilation vibes. Um, some people seem to love it, some people seem to like be very indifferent to it. I'm going to read you the blurb. When Leah finally returns after a deep sea mission that ended in catastrophe, her wife Miri knows that something is wrong. Whatever happened in that vessel stranded on the ocean floor, Leah has carried part of it with her onto dry land and into their home. As Miri searches for answers to her wife's altered state, she must face the possibility that the woman she loves is slipping from her grasp. So kind of weird vibes which we love of course um so yeah i'm gonna pick that one up for that. i hope the library will still have it for me tomorrow because i think my my hold is running out tomorrow so fingers crossed and then last couple of books that i haven't mentioned recently um the trials of coley so i read the book of coley in my mind when i was extremely heavily pregnant that's all i can think of when i think of the book of coley it was one of the last books i read before i gave birth i remember 
liking it, finding a lot of potential in it, but not necessarily loving it. And for whatever reason, in my, at the time, completionist brain, um, I ordered the rest of the trilogy. Now I'm a big DNFer, so um, I do think potentially I would be happy to scrap the rest of the trilogy if I don't enjoy this one, but equally, you know, maybe I will really like it, but I'm so picky these days. Um, but I am intrigued to see where it goes. I am. Um, Coley has been cast from his village and into the strange and deadly forest beyond, but he heard a story once, a story about lost London and the mysterious tech of the old times that was there, and if Coley can find it, there may be a way for him to redeem himself by saving what's left of humanity. And it's by M.R. Carey. And... Yeah, so the first book, it's set in like a super future world that has almost returned to basics. You know, environmental catastrophe, catastrophe has happened and people live in smaller communities again, that sort of thing. Um, and it's narrated by Coley and he has this kind of very specific dialect, which some people really hate. But I remember liking it in the book I originally read. So we'll see how we get on with that one. And then finally, a book that came through the door the other day and I just thought, do you know what, I'm gonna pop it on my April TBR. And it is Wish I Was Here by M. John Harrison, who is an author I discovered in my weird anthology. I have some of his books on my shelf, but I didn't put any of them on my 2023 TBR. And so I haven't got round to reading him yet, um, but I am very intrigued by him. Um, he's been immensely prolific he's written absolutely loads and he's sort of like got a bit of a cult following and is sort of a weird author weird genre bending author I think and this is actually a sort of memoir I think I'm just going to read the blurb so you can hear it from these words rather than my terrible attempt um, M. John Harrison has produced one of the most intriguing and multifaceted body bodies of fiction of any living British author, encompassing space opera, speculative fiction, fantasy, magical and literary realism. But is there even an M. John Harrison and where do we find him? This is the question the author asked asks even <laughs> in this memoir as mystery, turning for clues to 40 years of notebooking. A note or it never happened, a note or you never looked. Are these notebooks or notebooks records of failed presence? How do they shine light on childhood in the industrial Midlands? A portrait of the young artist in countercultural counter London on an adulthood of restless escape into hill and moorland escape landscapes. My tired brain is just saying <laughs> absolutely no at the moment. And do they tell us anything about the writing of the books, each one often so different from the last that it might have been written by another version of the author? With aphoristic daring and laconic wit, this anti-memoir will fascinate and delight you. So I don't typically get on with memoir, but if I was to, I mean, a description like that is probably about right for me. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it. And it's, it's either out now or coming out extremely soon. So um, I thought I would, I would just have my finger on the pulse for once in my life. Um, but anyway, my loves, I am going to love you and leave you now because I've got I to gotta shower. I've got to get myself comfortable. Um, and I want to read more Paradise, desperate to read more Paradise. So thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed this sort of... <laughs> step into the world of books and film and a little bit of renovation content that seems to be where I'm at at the moment that's all I want to do really at the moment is just make content about books and now maybe film as well I'm just um finding that to be where my heart is basically and I need to find a good way of translating that on my other platforms as well but yeah at the moment that just makes the most sense to me but thank you so much for watching today I hope you enjoyed and I will see you again very soon bye